There's a tens of millions of people literally whose credit history just doesn't actually reflect how they have behaved in the past. One of the most interesting parts of these market downturns is you have to transition from the peacetime CEO to the wartime CEO. What do you do inside the company itself? I am actually much better as a wartime CEO than a peacetime CEO. You definitely have to be made of a certain high density fiber to survive the ups and downs. You basically just assume that your job today is to survive and your job tomorrow is to win in a really, really big way that hopefully benefits the world. All right, guys, bang, bang, I've got Max here with me. Max, I thought a great place to start would be this idea of a new credit score. Uh, obviously, the idea of the old credit score, uh, most of the financial system is built on. You've had personal experience and also built an entire company around this idea of creating a new one. Help explain what you think the problems are with the old one and, and why we need a new one. Um, probably the most problematic thing with the old credit score is that it just doesn't really take into account that people's borrowing habits and approaches have changed. So I mean, this is very recursive, but uh, the NPL itself, majority of the pain for products that you see are just not included in the calculation of your FICO score or your Vantage score. And so that alone is a bunch of people's significant borrowing activity now. And even if you've paid every one of those loans back on time, the pain for just doesn't even appear in your credit history or your credit score. And the Consumer Financial Financial Protection Bureau recently sort of opined on it and basically said, hey, it would be really good if the industry would start reporting that. So I think it's going to change for the better relatively soon. But for this to really change, the companies that use those scores and compute those scores actually have to, uh, have to change their behavior. But even before BNPL, you know, the FICO score, which is the uh, the traditional Fair Isaacs company, um, so the, the, the lingua franca of, of borrowing, just would update very slowly. I mean, these days, actually, I think it updates a little bit faster. But back when I had my own brushes with the uh, credit scoring uh, um, problems, if you will, um, I think it took me something like 10 years to get rid of a black mark I had caused to myself in college by uh, running out of money and not being able to pay my bills. Um, so just the slow updating, lack of uh, data sources that really should be included, um, lack of familiarity with how younger generations use credit, and the fact that an enormous number of people, probably the most important because I should have started there, something like 30 to 50 million Americans have something that's just not really reflective at all of how they behave and who they are. And there's many different reasons why the information is inaccurate, there are mistakes in reporting, their data doesn't get included correctly, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, there's a tens of millions of people literally whose credit history and therefore credit score just doesn't actually reflect how they have behaved in the past when, when they borrowed money, or in fact, maybe just doesn't have any information at all. And they're completely excluded from a standard borrowing systems. So what's interesting about this is you're highlighting a disjointment, if you will. There's people who are doing activities, uh, and then the old systems don't account for that. Either they're inaccurate, they're slow, they're, they're whatever the problem is. Um, what I'm fascinated with, and I've been talking about for you know two years now or so, is we see this across the economy. It's not just in the credit score. So think of inflation as an example as well, where we still have people going into the grocery store with like a pad and paper and writing down you know what the uh, change in prices are. Uh, but it seems like whether it's a company like yours or other companies in the fintech sector, you have much more real-time information at point of sale. You know what people are paying. You know what the cost of, of change month over month, year over year. When you zoom out, and so not just credit score, whether it's inflation calculations or whatever, is the market ripe for just kind of like, hey, we have to digitize, we have to modernize, and like real-time information should now be the foundation for all of these different calculations and, and kind of data points that are being presented and, and people are using to make decisions? Yeah, that's a, a very good observation. And I think about a decade ago, I had this thesis that the transition from analog to digital will create incredible opportunities for companies and a firm is certainly one version of this idea in credit data. But the reality of analog data is just really irregular and error prone and Sort of fuzzy around the edges and highly likely to be inaccurate, even if it seems accurate. And so I think it's very, very hard to have a wholesale replacement of analog systems with digital systems. And so we're doing it piecemeal. 
which creates opportunities because if you figure out a clever way of accelerating part of the industry, a segment or just a, a, a flavor of analog and push it into digital wholesale, you'll suddenly be in possession of an information advantage, which, you know, again, at the 6,000 or 65,000 foot view just gives you an opportunity to, to, to arbitrage that. But I don't know if there's a way one can imagine to go from our still pretty analog lives to fully digital just really, really quickly. And I think we're, we're just going to keep stumbling through it. And in many ways, one of the things that makes China so interesting as a society, they came from a truly analog economy, so analog that transition to digital wasn't a choice. It was a sort of moral imperative. Like you can't have a country that big with that many changes that the many systems and just slowly move from analog to digital you just have to do it wholesale and combined with a centralized government I, in, in that particular scenario i actually think it helped them but when you when i talk to my friends in shanghai we talk about payments of course and uh, it's shocking sort of the, the level of innovation they see there and it's always falls right back into this idea well they have access to all this data and it's really accurate and everyone's on board with it there's no cards they just all comes from your phone and, and so on What's fascinating to me about you specifically is that you're working on a very hard problem. There's like the problem in front of you and then there's the broader thing that we just talked about. But also you have been able to navigate good times and bad times over and over and over again. And so you 2000 uh, tech boom and bust, then you've got the 2008 global financial crisis. We now are in this thing. I don't even yet know if people can really describe what it is, how long it'll last, how bad it'll be, whatever. Um, what are some of the lessons maybe from the past uh, market downturns that you now are implementing, whether it's personally or at a firm in terms of actually running the organizations that other people could learn from? Definitely uh, lots of learnings. Um, you definitely have to be made a, of a certain high density fiber to survive the ups and downs. I think that there's no there's no getting around that. The, the, the knocks sometimes are very hard and sometimes they get even harder and you're not prepared to take the beating and get up and go back to fighting. Um, you should stay on the floor and it, it, it sucks to fail. And I failed enough times to know just how painful it is and how frustrating it can be to be on the floor and realize hey, you really aren't going to be able to get up. But I, I choose to get up every time, even sometimes it means a failed company or two. Um, so that that's sort of the, <laughs> the, the, the hard knocks advice, I guess. Um, a couple of maybe more practical ones. As a leader, I've realized that everybody approaches kind of the, the, the punch in the face scenario differently. And sometimes the punch in the face is like, this happened and now we have to deal and we have a day left and, you know, et cetera. Sometimes it's kind of the dread of, oh, wow, the recession is really coming and people are going to have a harder time paying their bills. And well, that's going to be interesting. And in both of those scenarios, you kind of realize that hmm, this is going to get a lot tougher. Whatever hard you think you're experiencing right now, the future is not going to be easier. And the only way to cope with that is you kind of have to step back and try to get through the first two stages. You know, why is this happening? Why is it happening to me? And quickly get to, all right, so what does the solution look like? And in the ideal world, even, okay, is this an opportunity? Like if, if it's really difficult, it's probably really difficult for everyone. So am I going to be able to extract a competitive advantage or something might change for the better for us more so than our competitors? And you, as a human, you can't completely shake off the why is this happening? Why is it happening to me? And why is it happening to me now? What do I do to deserve this? You have to develop skills to cope with that moment. And everybody does it differently. In my case, I trained myself over the years and decades to sort of say, all right, just do nothing for a few minutes. Just let the information sink. It is not going to be good. It's not going to go away. It's not going to get better. But any emotional reaction in the moment isn't going to fix it for you. And so just let it wash over you for a moment or two. It's probably the case you're missing some information anyway. Give yourself a chance to absorb it and you'll move right on to the what's the solution and might this even be beneficial. And so that, that's a really important skill that I actually have to train myself for. Because in the past, certainly being or the, the personality of an entrepreneur is that this happened, jump into action, and you may well miss a piece of data that will later on prove crucial. Um, in terms of just practical advice for how do you cope with downturns, assume they're always coming, raise enough money, deal with the realities of 
unexpected loss of revenue, loss of growth, whatever the metric you care about rationally, you can't allow yourself to be emotional. You can't allow yourself to wallow in, you know, the sort of looping on why is this happening to me now is the worst thing you can do because then you're not acting. Um, and um, two other sort of most important things, people are the most important thing in the world um, by far. And so if you compromise your relationships with people you care about in the moment of impact or as you deal with impact, you're ultimately going to regret it very much. And so that is just a really important thing. It doesn't mean that you can't and won't have to make hard choices, but if you do it by putting aside your feelings and thoughts about humans that surround you, your team, people that you work with, your partners, you're absolutely going to regret it very badly. And so that, that's just a thing to be very mindful all the time. Most people don't need reminding of that, but some people feel like they need to act extra tough and ruthless in moments of difficulty. And you have to be tough and you have to be ruthless, but you have to continuously remember that you're not the only human on the planet. And uh, two, you have to try to ask the question, what does it look like if I compromise any of my values to to accomplish the whatever survival goal I have. And nine times out of 10, the answer, you will deeply regret that. And so in, in sort of my absolutist rule book, people and values are immutable, can't change them. I think that's maybe too maximalist of an advice. And so you have to, uh, you have to ask the question, you know, what, what am I doing and why am I doing it? But ultimately, if you're poking around your core values and thinking like, might I relax one of those things? That that's that's a real problem, and I strongly advise against that. It's a very long winded answer. No, it, it's great, and and I, I think that you've learned a lot. One of the most interesting parts of these market downturns is you have to transition from like uh, what many people would call like the peacetime CEO to the wartime CEO, and, and you're hinting at this a little bit. What do you do inside the company itself? Like, is there like a day where you declare, okay, I'm now a wartime CEO, and everyone's like, hey, we're going to to war, you know, essentially, or is it somewhat more of a, a slower transition as you realize things are getting worse? Uh, so it turns out, um, I am actually much better as a wartime CEO than a peacetime CEO. I found over the years that uh, if it's really peacetime, I start getting very restless and I kind of look around for war. And I, it's a little bit of a uh, samurai complex. I'm a big fan of samurai genre and, and stories and, and, and et cetera. So the noble warrior is uh, something that I at least pretend to identify with. But uh, there's lots of stories from medieval Japan where samurai would get restless and they would have to go find an enemy because otherwise they'd just start slaughtering each other. And uh, I, I don't slaughter my team or or sort of self-destruct, but I'm definitely more restless in in peacetime than I am in wartime. Um, it's actually a really important skill for CEO. So the, the thing that happens in peacetime is the team becomes comfortable with the level of crises that they have to deal with kind of at a retail level. You know, the difference between peacetime and, and wartime is fundamentally just the the frequency of crisis and the wholesale nature of it versus the retail nature of it. And so if most CEOs I know really struggle in this transition where you're like, hmm, more and more hits on the uh, you know sidewalls of, of, of the ship, is this a crisis? Is, is, is this a war? And for most of us, I think the tendency, even if you sort of enjoy the wartime intensity, say, well, okay, this is problematic, but you know, we're not able to quite declare you know, DEF CON 5 or whatever the number is. And I found over the years that it's actually much healthier to just say, okay, things have changed. The pivot to wartime mentality isn't going to be careful and deliberate. We're, we're going to have to declare that this is in fact wartime. We're fighting for our lives. There's lots of problems out there and we're going to beat the enemy or survive the, the storm. But it's happening now. It's not, it's not, it's not happening slowly. And I've experimented with messaging over the years. Uh, I found that uh, if you try to uh, peanut butter it a little bit more carefully, you just ultimately get very frustrated. Where not everybody's on the same page. So you, you kind of have to bring everyone along. And as a wartime CEO, the number one thing you have to do is communicate and communicate clearly, communicate well. And so long as you're clear about why certain things are no longer true and certain behaviors are no longer going to fly, some people might say, well, that's not what I came here to do. But those that thrive in kind of this sharp black and white scenarios will probably appreciate you for for being clear and appreciate the moment to to shine and embrace the uh embrace the struggle ahead 
as you're doing this, you're a publicly traded company. And so there's everyone and their mom has an opinion. There's plenty of critics out there. They're looking at a stock price that moves hour to hour, day to day. Uh, your reaction alone is kind of, hey, that's uh, very antithetical, I think, to like somebody who has a long-term vision trying to solve a big problem. Um, how have you as a public company CEO really balanced if I was just building a company or building a solution, you know, th there's this long-term mentality, but you do have to manage the public expectations and the critics and, and all that. And so like, what lessons have you learned there over the years? This episode is brought to you by Eight Sleep. Good sleep is a game changer and the Eight Sleep pod is the best sleep machine. I sleep on it every single night. A great night of sleep allows you to be healthier, be more rested, and have more energy throughout the day. And on the brand new 8 Sleep Pod 3, you can sleep as cold as 55 degrees Fahrenheit or as hot as 110 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the secret of thermoregulation. Better sleep, better energy. Get yourself an 8 Sleep. You can go to 8sleep.com slash pomp today to go ahead and get $150 off your order. 8sleep.com slash pomp. Not only do I sleep on it every night, it literally changed my life, and I begged the founders to let me invest in the company. 8sleep.com slash pomp. Go get yourself an 8sleep pod and get a better night of sleep. In public for less than eight quarters, and so uh, it's probably a little too early to ask me for a uh, rule book of how to be a public company um, CEO with a, with a great plan. Um, I think probably the most important thing as a public company CEO anyway, is to understand who your major shareholders are. Um, I think I'm still my own, one of the larger shareholders for sure. And so ultimately I have, if not the most, quite a lot to lose um, or gain from the performance of a firm as a long-term investment. I think. My heart goes out to day traders that lose or make money on a firm, but I spent less than a nanosecond actually thinking about them. I very much care about making return on investment for my long-term shareholders, of which I am one, of which many, most of our employees are. And so the notion that, well, I got a vision and I just got to go there and I don't care about the stock price, I think is disingenuous. Um, this is a capitalist enterprise. We've raised quite a lot of money. A lot of those shares are still owned by people who gave us the money to build this company. And it's my duty and, and job to give them an excellent return. And that's, I certainly intend to do. The good news or the comforting news is that when we raised the money, we told them the same story over and over again. The very vision that we put in our S1 was in our first financing deck. It's actually sort of insane. I've, I don't think I've ever run a company that did not pivot except for a firm. Every single project I've ever had, and this is, I lost count, but this is in the teens of companies that I've started. And everyone except for this one, at some point said, ah, we're really not going to do this. We're going to do this something else. And not a firm. A firm has always been in this honest financial products mission, and uh, we continue to do so. So the story has never changed. People that bought our shares in Series A through the IPO have all heard the same thing. We promised them that we will do our absolute darnest to make an exceptional return on their investment. And that is the plan. And they have seen the plan and have seen the story that we think will get us there. We keep on growing, we keep on printing really good results. The vicissitudes of the stock market are sometimes frustrating in a sense that you you feel disoriented by the, uh, by the dizziness of, uh, we post a great quarter, the market penalizes it for it. There's a some other random signal, and uh, suddenly the market rewards it for it. And like, well, did I do this, or did some external factor have had a, uh, a hand in this? And ultimately, I, I keep myself focused by being frustrated with features are that are not shipping fast enough, or conversion rates that are not as good as I want them to be, and uh, pennies that we leave on the floor when we should be picking them up, things like that. And so I, I'm, I'm very, very internally focused and goal driven for the company in the service of the, of the strategy that comes from the mission. It doesn't hurt to have total conviction that what we're doing is important and believe that we're pursuing the mission in with the right strategy. I think once you start losing faith in your strategy or your mission, that's when you get really, really tailspun. Like at, at that point, you really should rethink everything. And that's when you start listening to the voices outside her screaming at you saying, you should do X or Y because obviously you're an idiot. And I'm, I'm 
pretty far from from uh, feeling that way. So I'm I'm quite sanguine. So as you built this business, one of the things that I've seen uh, talked about publicly is uh, a focus on building the right culture. And I think of culture as something that attracts the right talent. It kind of rejects certain types of talent. How do you think about building that in today's day and age, right? It's 2022. There's all kinds of chaos going on. Like, how do you kind of stay true to what that culture is over years where many people, I think, would argue just like society has been changing as well, right? So kind of everything's moving around you. How do you keep a culture that uh, attracts the people you're looking for to help? Help you on this mission? It's a great question. Um, and by the way, I think in that particular domain, I'm still very much in learning mode. And everything I thought I knew changed with the pandemic. And everything I know changes with every 100 employees, maybe every 500 employees that we add. When we were tiny, it was really easy to enforce the culture. And I, I built the Affirm Card culture very, very deliberately. I had obviously lots of experience with building teams in the past. Some I thought were spectacular, others were less so, and I had to fix culture. It's really, really hard to rewrite your culture. It's basically a mass layoff if you end up thinking, my God, you know, culture is way broken. More than half the people are not the way, interacting the way that you think they should be. And so I was very fortunate a firm was very deliberately built. We wrote down our core values before we incorporated the company. We wrote down our mission, which has never changed. So all, all of that, the foundation is right. As you get larger, you have to over communicate it. You have to continuously reiterate what it means. And the amount of drift in interpretation of the core values and the mission is staggering. Like you literally look away and people say, well, you said this in our core values and here's how I interpret it. And when you're a hundred person company, you can say, no, no, that, that's just silly. I'm like, that's not actually what I mean. If you have 2,600 employees, which is roughly where we are, you don't get to hear that. You, you don't get to say, well, wait, hang on a second. That, that's just not right. And so you have to over communicate as much as possible. What do you really mean? And a lot of times it comes down to, all right, so here's a situation in front of us or in front of an employee that you may have never met or I have never met. And they're thinking about making this really tough moral choice. And they think they fully understand what it means for the backbone of our company to stay straight and narrow. And um, I think those we have done an exceptionally good job just hammering, like, no, we will never screw our consumers. Like, there's lots of ways to make money in this world, and there are things we will not do. And some others do it, and others even have really good explanations for why they do it, and we will not. We just don't think it's right, and that's off limits. And I would be shocked if people within a firm were like, well, but like one day we'll do those things. Like, no, we won't. Like, I think Pitchfork will come out as soon as somebody suggests that and they'll, they'll be carried out from, from their Zoom room. But in more subtle matters, like, you know, one of the really interesting uh, things to, to debate is when, so one of our core values is um, people come first. And um, it's really tempting to say it's all the people. And then you have a sorting function. Well, so, I'm a people and you're a people and we have some employees that are people and most of them, all of them maybe. And then we have consumers and lots of others. And the original meaning of the core value people come first is very, very, very clearly articulated in the, the, the first set of writings that I did about a firm. And that is we put our borrowers ahead of ourselves. Like we will not take advantage of them. We will not make money when they are in trouble and so on and so forth. And just explaining that very, very clearly and making sure people really understand very deeply that ultimately we are a service organization. We are serving a consumer that has needs and we choose to place their needs ahead of our own. That's just how it's meant to be. And that's not the easiest thing to absorb for some. I think you have a... And, and on the other side of this is actually this notion of, all right, well, if that's really true, like why aren't we a nonprofit? And like I have some very strong words to, uh, to describe why we're not, uh, and, uh, and, and so on. So anyway, so I, these are all kind of maybe very low level examples of, um, how the stuff gets harder and harder as you get larger in size, because inevitably these conversations occur when you're not in the room. And so it's, it's my job to teach all of my directs and their job to teach their directs and so on. And so, so long as the conversation keeps going and the messages are repeated in consistent ways, then it, it, it does really well and, and survives. And I think we've done a good job. I think it's a lot harder in Zoom rooms because you just don't quite have as much interaction in real time. 
I, I was just going to ask, uh, I worked at Facebook for a couple of years and, uh, what has now become somewhat of a joke, but there was literally posters, you know, move fast and break things done is better than perfect. Like you would walk down the hall and it was like an, an indoctrination of certain, whether they were actual values or, or like certain phrases that, uh, kind of reinforced what the company was about. That's great when you actually have hallways, but if you're on Zoom, uh, I don't see any posters behind your head that are like <laughs> reinforcing the company values. So h- how do you do it? Um, I think that's a, a, I was going to show you my virtual background during the <laughs> early days of the pandemic, but I think that this is a different laptop. I, uh, when pandemic just began and we suddenly went into the Zoom land, I was like, what do I do to sort of tell people something, you know, this, this was all these pixels behind me. And, um, um, I, I had the, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide, uh, cover with the big don't panic on it as, as my, as my background for quite some time. But, uh, <laughs> it's been long enough in the strange world of zoom that, uh, I don't even have the file anymore. I'm not sure where the, uh, the image map went. Um, so I think the couple of thoughts on how do you, how do you, um, preserve the culture or amplify the culture in a world where you don't have hallways, which I think is, is pretty, uh, pretty great, important question. It's easier. The cheat code on preserving the culture is you make it very explicit in your interviewing process and your recruiting process that there's a certain flavor of how we do and do not do things here that we really care about certain decisions a lot and maybe don't care about others as much. And you self-select or you pre-select the people who join to understand what this is, this place is all about. Like we are building a profitable capitalist enterprise. We take great pride in it. And yet we also are very, very hell-bent on treating our borrowers right, delivering value to our merchant partners and not cheating by creating fees and hidden charges the way the industry has sort of chosen to cheat. And you have to go through the trouble of explaining that. And for some people, I think it might be a, well, maybe I don't want to work here because you want to maximize profit by any means necessary. And that's outside of my core values and, or, and maybe it's equally the poor people are like, well, wait a second, why are you insisting on making profit? And, and we insist on, on, on that. Uh, so making sure the culture is self-perpetuating through the interviewing process is one of the ways you can maybe make it a little bit easier in a world with no hallways. The other way in a world with no hallways is, <laughs> has been certainly my, my play for the last uh, several months since the pandemic has been a little bit easier to navigate, is you travel. Uh, we have a lot of offices around the world now. Um, my next week will be in Poland where we have an office, which will be really exciting. I haven't seen that one yet. Uh, But the week before was in Chicago and the one a couple of weeks prior was in New York. And in, even in the world where most people are in their office sort of Tuesday through Thursday these days, as opposed to a full week, it's just really, really great to have a moment to interact with real humans and to do, do my part and help them reinforce the culture. And I don't know if we will ever have too many posters just because not, not enough time to, to look at them all, but, uh, Conversations are more valuable than, than posters and walls, in, in my opinion. So we encourage people to travel. We encourage people to get together in person. We have lots of offsites where teams get together and spend as much time interacting, just kind of reinforcing the culture with each other as they do working. So I think that you, in aggregate, I don't think it's an impossible task, but it's certainly something you have to be very deliberate about. One of my last questions for you, uh, you are incredibly intelligent. You're very kind of thoughtful, I think, in a lot of uh, uh, your public appearances and our conversation here. Um, And you have been part of a number of different teams that I think people really look up to and they say, hey, you guys have been successful. You've been able to attract other smart, intelligent, hardworking people. What do you personally do to learn? Are you reading books in your free time? Are you listening to podcasts? Are you uh, doing, you know, something that no one's ever heard of before? Like, like, what are you doing given that you have this day job that obviously has all this pressure associated with it? But what, how do you learn on a day-to-day basis? It's a great question. Um, probably the single most useful predictor of success that I have discerned in, in my decades hanging around this, this planet Um is curiosity combined with intelligence is just a, a really, really good predictor of success. And maybe more so curiosity than 
than than anything else really. And um, I am naturally curious, so it's helpful. I don't have to work too hard at wanting to learn more. Um, I do I do a fair amount. Uh, I read quite a lot. We used to uh, used to publish what Max is reading newsletter to affirmers just to uh, keep them guessing what the next book will be. I'm fairly omnivorous. <laughs> Um, uh, for when, when we did have hallways, we had a, a bookshelf where it'd be a couple of copies of whatever it is that I was gorging myself on. I tend to read multiple books at a time. Um, one cool pro tip. Um, so if you read books on Kindle, you should buy the Kindle plus audible bundle because Kindle plus audible tracks where you are reading digitally. And you can literally go from, I'm reading this on my phone. Now I have to drive. I'm going to flip it over to Audible and have it read to me. So you can go through a book very, very quickly. Uh, I, of course, listen to things on one and a half times speed and, or, or faster if I can help it. Um, I found that there's an incredible amount of really great content on YouTube. So I watch tons of lectures on YouTube uh, and, and other sources, but YouTube is mostly free. Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts. I actually quite enjoy the genre. I thought I would hate it, but uh, it turns out that it's, it's quite nice. It's good work there. <laughs> Um, I definitely rabbit hole into Wikipedia way too often. Uh, I, it, it's, it's a, it's a pretty fun pastime. And then I tend to try to find creative outlets for myself that require learning. So for example, I, I studied music as a kid and I hadn't really gone back to it in quite some time. And then recently i decided that to sort of exercise the other side of the brain i have to go deep into music and so i've been learning how to use various digital audio workstation software and reading and watching music theory lectures and all kinds of stuff which there's only so many minutes per day to do it but it just forces you to exercise a learning muscle in the other part of the brain that is not related to things like discounted cash flow and uh, machine learning based underwriting and like all the stuff that i do day in and day out for work. And that that seems to help. You can sometimes draw parallels where you say, oh, I saw this really interesting random thing about music theory and it's nothing like underwriting, except there's some similarity. Maybe I should go pull on that for a little while. And so that I I try to learn as much as I can every day. I highly recommend it. Being curious is really good. Um, maybe the other one, one last random bit of advice and this is applicable to every question you ask, perhaps. Um, maybe two part. Um, one, being cynical is just a, a loss proposition. It's like a lose-lose proposition. There's, there's no way to win if you're a cynic. Uh, the Greeks had it right. Cynic means dog-like. And uh, I, there's, there's nothing good about cynic being, being cynical. That said, cynicism is kind of an approximation for evaluation of risk. When you sort of look at the world and say, oh, man, nothing's going to work out. This sucks. Like we're, we're already done. And like sort of the ultimate cynicism, you know, like where, where's the nearest bathtub? I, I need a, you know, a razor blade. And um, that, that's a terrible way to live. And I strongly advise against it. That said, you have to be eyes wide open. Like when you're looking at the world and you're saying a uh, you know, big iceberg is floating in the water, you can't say full speed ahead. You have to figure out a way to get around it. And so I found that the posture of short term risk averse trying to figure out how to not hit the iceberg that's right in front of you while being extraordinarily optimistic about the future and taking outsized risk bets on the future outcomes has worked really well for me where you basically just assume that your job today is to survive and your job tomorrow is to win in a really really big way that hopefully benefits the world that combined with curiosity you can get reasonably far i i love that uh in a way, you've basically made learning a hobby. Like you're you, to do all of that, right? You're just constantly learning. I, I tend to find myself doing the same thing, and it really upsets people in my life who are like, "I don't want to watch YouTube anymore," right? And I'm like, "No, no, no!" But like, why would we watch the other thing? <laughs> like the other thing kids? is making us dumber. Uh, I do. I have a young daughter, and uh, uh, I'm trying to train her. Like, why don't you also watch YouTube rather than cartoons? I, that, that's yeah. Uh, I have a. I have an eleven and a almost 13 year old and uh, they are unfortunate 
victims are like, oh my God, I just saw this amazing obscure video that taught me something that you really, really have to know. Let's watch this together. It's this crazy chess opening you've never heard of. Like, <laughs> what are you talking about? There's TikTok. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, my last question for you is a fun one. Uh, I, I'm always fascinated by uh, people's belief. Do you think aliens are real? And not only yes or no, but like, how do you kind of think through that problem, which we may never get an answer to, or maybe uh, we're going to get an answer, you know, sooner than, than we'd like. But how do you think about whether aliens are real or not? I can't say I spend too much time thinking about the binary answer to the question. So I'm a huge fan of science fiction. And in my copious spare time, I read an inordinate amount of science fiction. I'm quite a big fan of quote unquote, a hard sci-fi where aliens are real and rocket ships travel you know, from world to world. I think the world would be so much more boring if this all turned out to be not true. Like, I, I just don't want to learn today, which I, fortunately, I think it's impossible to really learn that there's nothing else out there. It's just us. The point of view that no, it really is. It's just us. And there's no one, nothing intelligent, lots of cold, rocks and elements floating around in, in nothingness and we're in a very, very center of it all sitting around trying to solve our petty little problems. It's very boring and I, 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 choose, to, uh, I choose to hope that it's better than that. I've obviously read all the various uh, thought experiments, sort of how do you convince yourself that uh, at a certain scale the probabilities approach 100% and on all of that. Um, I'm not sure we understand are surrounding so well that any of those approximations are really to be relied upon. But from the sort of a, what would be more interesting, like what would satisfy my curiosity, you kind of want to believe they're real, right? I mean, yeah, it would be uh, one, boring, but also two, uh, it kind of feels like that's the last new world. Right, like kind of Earth is uh, to some degree discovered. Yeah, sure, there's still maybe some pockets that, that we don't know as much about and, and things like the ocean or whatever, but it does feel like the, the frontier of space and uh, whether there's life or not and other planets, all that kind of stuff. Um, aspiration is important for humanity and it gives us something to look forward to and build towards and, and stuff like that. So it would be kind of depressing if all of a sudden it was like, hey, uh, actually, it's just like a wall. Like you can't go past it or something. Uh, I think that would be a, a sad a sad answer. Yeah, there's also really good literature that shows that at least attempts to prove that what we've had here, assuming you believe in some version of evolution, is just not that special. Like there's all these things that happen, but they're all kind of basic chemical reactions in lots of time and not even that much time. And so if you kind of subscribe to well understood principles of basic physics, there's been enough time in all sorts of places to have variants of evolution take place. The fact or the, the, the idea, hopefully not the fact that we are the one branch of the decision tree, the possibility tree that actually got to intelligent life is depressing and boring and would be a lot more fun if if it were not the case. Now, there's all, all the obvious, well, and then aliens show up and they don't like us and <laughs> we have to uh, deal with Independence Day scenarios, uh, the, the infamous movie. Um, meh, I think my, my, this is sort of another belief, but uh, I think generally speaking, most intelligent species, even as they approach our intelligence, assuming at the moment at least we, we are the smartest ones we know, they trend towards good. So if you sort of, the smarter you get, I think the more benevolent and uh, you replace your aggression with curiosity. And if that's true, we're certainly not capable today of interstellar travel. And to do that, the energy you have to muster is roughly equivalent to sort of the planetary energy sources. Like we, we could probably travel interstellar if we could gather up all the energy on earth and, and, and start propelling ourselves that way. So whoever shows up here, if they do so first, they'll have to be a lot more intelligent than us. And if that's the case, my guess and belief is that they'll, they will have progressed to being more and more benign. And so maybe they'll show up and you know, we'll, we'll teach us interesting things or we'll make great pets.
<laughs> One or the other. I, I love it. Uh, Max, listen, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Uh, it, it is awesome to see what you guys are building with the firm. And then you have thank decades and decades of experience. I think a lot of people can learn from. So hopefully they got something out of this. Uh, and we will definitely do it again in the future. Sounds good. Thanks for having me.